great to be here with all of you today. And we have some visitors out there, and we have some of our people that are visiting elsewhere today. Our prayers are with everybody in traveling today. This is not only the Lord's Day, but we know this is a holiday, uh, the Easter holiday. And we remember the time of year, every year, where our Lord was resurrected. But we know as Christians, we celebrate uh, all religious facets of our Lord and Savior every day and every first day of the week. And But this is a time where the world looks to the resurrection of Christ because it did happen at this time of the year. Uh, and we want to capitalize on that, building one another up, worshiping God, but also trying to serve others. It's great to be here with all of you today. As I said, we had a, an Easter egg hunt out here this morning, and it sounded like a herd of horses running from the front all the way around to the side over there, all the kids that, that went down there. And then they came in to feed them in here. Uh, we were sitting in here in the adult class, and it just sounded like a herd of horses running around the building. But uh, we were glad that our kids got to have some fun and learn a little lesson as well in that. You would turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Frank gave me five minutes up here, so I got three more minutes. <laughs> but uh, I may get fired, but I may go over a little, a little more in five minutes today. Deuteronomy chapter 31. I said verse 3, but as, as normal, I'm going to start a little bit before that. Last week in our sermon, we started out in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I didn't plan to just jump right to the next chapter. But where we're at here is the Hebrews, they're about to cross Jordan. Moses' life is coming to an end. And the, most of the Hebrews, well, all of them, most of them, had died in the wilderness. And there was a new generation of the Hebrews that was about to cross over into the promised land. And as we've said before, Deuteronomy is the restating of the law. And that's what the word means. Uh, but Moses is restating the law to this new generation. And he's explaining to them what's going to take place. Last week we talked about the decision that they had to make. The connection that Moses had to make with them in telling them, look, you've got a choice to make here. Plus or minus, stand up and be counted. But here in verse 31, chapter 31, excuse me, he's talking to them and he talks about their leadership. Now, I don't care what anybody says. Whenever you have strong leadership in something, you do better. Now, a lot of people, we get our pride built up. We maybe a little arrogance sprinkled in there and, and, and maybe add a little bit of that selfishness in there. And we would say, well, I'm my own person. Nobody leads me. Nobody tells me what to do. That's not how it is, brethren. That's not how we're made. God made us, and he made us to be led. And we're to be led by God himself. And that's what Moses is saying here. So let's read this real quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 1. He says, so Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to come and go. And the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan. Now look, pay close attention to verse 3. It is the Lord your God who will cross ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua is the one who will cross ahead of you, just as the Lord has spoken. This right here should be the ultimate pregame speech. The ultimate building up of them. He is telling them, these, these are people that have seen the cloud of the Lord going before them in the wilderness, guiding them, God providing them food and water, God providing them all that they needed. God even made them where their clothes didn't wear out. Can you imagine? I mean, that's a parent's dream right there. Your kids had clothes that didn't wear out yeah. and grew with them. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> And grew along with them as well. Sometimes it's not wearing out, it's getting small. But we see right here, 
They were used to God helping them and strengthening them and guiding them. But Moses is giving them, along with that statement in chapter 30, about making a choice and choosing. He's saying, God is going to go ahead of you. You're not going to be crossing over into a land where all there is is death and destruction in front of you. You're going to be crossing over into a pagan land where God has already went. And a lot of times we find that when we see dark tunnels in life, when we see dark clouds, when we see tough years and tough lives and tough situations, if we open our eyes, brethren, and put our hands together and pray every now and then, we figure out God's already been there. He knows the way. He's been there and done that, and he's prepared the way for you and for me. And that's the ultimate comfort. Buck spoke about hope in his prayer a few minutes ago. Hope's a powerful thing, brethren. I know it's a powerful thing. You find a country in this world with people that have hope, can't stop them. You find a country in this world where people have lost hope, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. Hope is a powerful thing in our world today, brethren. How many of y'all have seen the movie Braveheart? Nani hates this movie. She says it's a man flick. I love it. Okay, I love this movie. Sir William Wallace, of course we know that's Mel Gibson right there, but this is Hollywood's rendition of Sir William Wallace. And he's the one I want to talk about today a little bit. Start now. I studied up on Sir William Wallace. I even looked at some of his tactics in battle. Pretty smart. He was a leader of men. 1297 AD. He had decided when the English army was coming into Scotland and taking advantage of people and, and making people poor and making people slaves and just putting down the population, he had had enough of it. And he decided to lead this ragtag bunch of people against this massive army. One thing that I saw, Sir William Wallace didn't always win every <coughs> battle. He lost some. But every battle he was in, he was always outnumbered. At least two to one. The English had the equipment. They had the horses. They had the best arrows. They had the best bows, the best cavalry officers. They had it all. You had a bunch of Scotsmen that were used to running over rocks and running over mountains in little bitty sandals and little leather clothes. But you know what? They had a leader. And he led his army. And he won many battles. But what he did is he gave them hope. And that is the point. If you watch the movie about this, and there's not, you know, some of the movie's accurate, some of it's not. But the Scottish people, they stood there, they didn't want him. When they hear the English army coming, especially in those days, you hear that armor rattling, and you hear that foot stomping and the ground shaking. They were like, you know what, we're going back to our cave in the Scottish Highlands, and we're going to raise turnips with mama, okay? We don't want any of this. But here comes William Wallace. And his ancestors that wore the paint on their face, that represented that Scottish flag, that blue color. And here he comes up there and he starts saying, we can do this. We're going to do this. I'm not behind you telling me what to do. I'm in front of you. And we're going to do this. And he inspired men and he inspired women to go and to fight for freedom. Freedom is what we all want. And I'm not talking about freedom from tyranny, although that's a good freedom to have. Freedom from communism, freedom from all of these world powers. It's a good thing to have in this country, and I'm proud of that, to have the freedom that God blessed us with in this country. But I'm talking about freedom from eternity, freedom from sin, freedom from the guilt of sin. Whenever we do mess up, whenever we do sin, not just in a minute, but maybe in a year, in a few years, in 30 years, when we return to Christ, He's there for us, and He forgives us. When our heart is right and we're penitent, those sins can be washed away. That is freedom. That's freedom because it leads to the next life, and the next life, time doesn't exist. 
knows who that is? Pat. Right. I do. General George S. Patton. Commander, I, I'd be up here all day if I was telling you what things he commanded, the different battles, the different groups. Commanded 7th Army, U.S. Army in North Africa and the Mediterranean. Commanded 3rd Army in Europe in running the Nazis back out of that, back out of Europe, and then ultimately destroyed them. He's a leader. People followed him. People trusted him. And we'll get back to those two words, following and trust. But they trusted him. Man that I respected, my brother in Christ, some of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren here today, Maurice Johnson, he was a part of Third, Third Army, wasn't he? He was a radio operator. He understood that old blood and guts, which was Patton's nickname, he also had a nickname Bandito because he was involved in the Mexican Revolution. I didn't know that until a few days ago. But he always knew that whenever they were pressing forward and casualties were, were coming back and forth and people were dying and people were fighting and people were yelling and screaming and going about against insurmountable odds, he said he'd look up and he'd see a guy come walking up with a helmet on and two ivory handled pistols on his belt. And he knew that that was George Patton. He wasn't in the back unless they drug him back there. He was in the front. You see, he led men against insurmountable odds, against things that they thought they couldn't do. He gave them hope. He gave them a purpose. And he led them. But something else there. He was willing to walk right by the man on the front lines and go up and take the battle in his team. And that inspired men as well. And that's what Maurice said to me, Brother Maurice Johnson. God rest his soul. He told me one time, he said, Bo, you don't understand how close you can get your body to the ground until somebody's flying over dropping bombs on you. He said, you can get pretty close to that ground in that ditch or wherever you're hiding. But he said his leader was always walking by at the front lines. Are we talking about today a leader or a courier? Now, what do I mean when a courier? What am I talking about there? In the old English times, the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, in England, they had couriers, what they called couriers. Now, we think of a courier as someone that would take papers or something somewhere for us. But in those days, a courier was someone, if you were going on a trip, whether you were royalty or you were rich or whatever, you sent a courier ahead of you. What did he do? He went down the roads. He made sure the roads were taken care of. He went down to the hotels or motels or inns. He made sure you had reservations. He made sure the cook was good. He made sure that there were no altercations, there were no battles, there were no rebellions going on in where you were going. He went ahead of you and prepared the way for you. So whenever you went on your journey, the value of a courier was seen in your trip. Now, if your curry were sorry, and he was just off in some club somewhere, some bar or pub, they call them, over there, I guess. He's over there in some pub, and he's getting drunk, and he's not paying attention to his job, and all of a sudden, you're stuck in the middle of the road somewhere, or you get to an inn, and it's burnt down. You look at that, brethren, and you say, he's not a very good curry. But if you go on your way, and you're safe, and you're fed, and the road is easy, the way is true. That's what a good courier is. Brethren, today I've shown you a couple of leaders here of men. And you could say they were pagans, I guess. A lot of people would say that about William Wallace. A lot of people would say it about George Fat. But they were leaders of men. And the leadership is what we need. Moses was saying, you're going to have the leadership. I'm going ahead of you. He made this world. He made the river you're crossing. He made the promised land. And I'm going in there first. That inspires hope. God also prepared the way for them. 
He parted the Red Sea. He gave them food and water as we talked about. He gave them the path to walk. He punished them for 40 years. But then he gave them an inheritance across that Jordan. Yes, they had to work for it. Yes, they had to fight for it. Yes, they messed up. But in the end, these were God's children. And God led them. And God prepared the way for them. So which is better? When we look at this in our context today under the covenant of Christ. We have a leader, brethren. The King of kings. The Lord of lords. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. He leads us. He's there for us. We're talking about the resurrection today. He's also a courier. He's prepared the way. He goes ahead of us. He went into that grave for us. He was in that tomb for us. He prepared the way. God raised him from the dead to eternal life. And he gives us life for us because he loves us. He is that leader and that courier. People will follow someone that is both. We say, which one is better? You want a leader or you want somebody to go and prepare the way? As I said, these great leaders were always up at the front. They were willing. They weren't willing to say, you're going to go out there, but I'm not going to go. I'll sit back. These leaders were willing to say, you're going to go down there because I've already been there. And I know what you got to do. And I can do it, and you can do it, and we can do it together. That's what Jesus is telling us today. We can do this together. He's been through this world. He's been through temptation, more temptation than we can imagine. And in that temptation, he overcame even death through our Heavenly Father. Jesus is saying, I've been there and I have done that. Now come follow me. That's somebody I want to follow right there. Not just on Sunday. Not just once down one time a year. Not just one time in 20 years. But every day of the week. Every part of our life. In everything that we do, whether it's worship or life or anything, giving life to someone else through Christ, through showing them the scriptures. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying everything in the past, everything in the present, and everything in the future that has to do with the truth of salvation that God's graciously given us, it's through him. Amen. It's through Christ. And that's his point there. He has prepared the way because he went first. He died on that cross. The other day, Friday, we were driving down the road and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. <coughs> it hit me like a ton of bricks. I looked over at Nani and I said, you know what? This is the day the Lord was hanging on the cross. That Friday before. That day before on Thursday where he was arrested. And then that Friday from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Where he hung on that cross for you and for me. For all those that have gone on before us. And all of us that have gone after us. That believe in God. That follow God through his son Jesus Christ. Romans 6 verse 3. He said, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. But he who has died has freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Wow! You talk about going to the front lines for us. Jesus went there first in all of his walks in life and then even to the point of death. Why? Because his father told him to. His leader told him to. Our leader today tells us, 
I've got this. I died that death on the cross. You have the forgiveness of sins. Don't be afraid of death because it's not master over you. It's not master over your friends and your family, all those that come to God through Christ. Don't worry about it. Christ is saying, I prepared the way. Three days later, that tomb was empty. You know the thing about William Wallace? He's got a grave somewhere, and he's in it. His old bones are in there. Might have turned to dust, I don't know. General George S. Pat, he's in a grave somewhere. Probably a nice monument or tomb. But our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is not in a grave anywhere on this planet. He walked out of that tomb. That's the kind of leader I want to follow right there. That's the one that gives me peace now and gives me the peace of knowing that there's preparation. We've all been through hard days. I've been through some hard days, y'all. But I know that God has been there first. I know that the way is prepared. I have no problem walking down a road that my courier and my leader has already walked down. And he's telling all of us, you can do this. All you got to do is make a choice. Stand up and be counted. What's better, a leader or a courier? Both. A leader is entrusted with the life of the followers. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Y'all know I'm a page flipper. I like to turn and read right out of the Bible here. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That word entrust, that brings hope. That brings courage. That makes you want to fight when everybody else says lay down. That our leader, our King of Kings, Jesus Christ, His Father, we're entrusted to them. Our soul is entrusted to them. I don't want anybody else, anything else, in charge of my soul or my family's soul or my brethren's soul. And God the Father and His Son. That's a powerful thing. It's a big responsibility. Another general, Dwight Eisenhower, yeah, he talk, told me this years ago, one of the worst decisions, one of the hardest decisions he ever had to make was make, given the order to make the Normandy landing for the army to land on that beach. He was entrusted with the lives of all those soldiers. It was the hardest decision he ever had to make because he knew when he signed that order that hundreds of probably thousands of men would lose their lives. But you know what? He was a leader. He was entrusted with not only their lives, but the lives of all of us in this country. I want my soul to be entrusted to God. Because He loves me more than I can ever possibly imagine. I can't tell y'all how much He loves me. Because I myself and my little pea brain, I can't even imagine it. I can try to emulate it. But it's a powerful thing, brethren. A courier is known, as we talked about, for their excellent and concise preparation. Now I want y'all to turn back to John chapter 13. <coughs> John chapter 13. Now a lot of times John 14, verses 1 through 4 is read when you're talking about preparation. But I'm going to back up a little bit here. John chapter 13, starting at verse 34. This is Jesus speaking here. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now stop for a second. Let me tell you that. Jesus is already saying he's a courier. He's prepared the way. Not only the way, but how you walk the way. And he goes on here. He says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. You see, the Lord says, I'm preparing a way. I want you to love one another the way I've loved you. I want other people to see how you love one another. And then he's saying, I got to go and I got to prepare a way for you. 
Oh, Peter, well, I want to go with you. I want to go. I want to go. That's what my grandkids say. Little Paul's going to the store. I want to go. I want to go. Peter's saying, I want to go. I want to. No, you can't go now, but you're going to go sooner or later. But Jesus knew he had to prepare the way, and then Jesus told him about his own weakness and what he would do. But then he comes to him. Right down in chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. <laughs> Beautiful words. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Jesus is saying, I'm not only going first, I'm coming back to get you. You know, that's a comfort, brethren. That's a comfort to me. That's a comfort should be to all of us as Christians. That comforting feeling that the Lord has went ahead of us, but he's coming back to get us. He is our leader. He is our preparer or our courier. Now today, a little bit closer to modern times, I want to show you a leader. Anybody know this gentleman's name? Frank does. That's Marshall Keeble. Marshall Keeble. 20s or 30s, right around in there. This minister was responsible for baptizing into Christ over 30,000 souls. Over 30,000 souls. He wasn't the wealthiest. He, he wasn't, you know, the greatest. He was the kind of leader and the kind of courier that was the servant. He was the servant. He was preaching a sermon there in Tennessee one time. <coughs> Excuse me. And people were coming up and they were repenting of their sins. Some people were coming forward to obey the gospel. And this guy walks up. And this was during a hard time in our country. During the time of civil rights. And this guy comes up. And he had a pair of brass knuckles in his pocket. You may notice his eye right here. You can tell a little bit. But he's had those brass knuckles in his pocket. He gets right up there to Marshall Keeble. And he rears back and he busts him right in the face. Right there in front of everybody. After he had been preaching the gospel. After he had been trying to change people's lives. Out of lives out of love and service. Everybody said, call the police. Call 911. Grab the guy. Marshall Keeble said, don't touch him. Don't touch him. Let him go. This coward ran out the door with his brass knuckles. He said, let him go, let him go. You see, he was there to preach the gospel to all those people that were coming forward, all those people that were listening, but he was preaching the gospel to the guy that had the brass knuckles. Two. He let him go. He'll work out that problem. Turned out he had broke bones in his orbital bone here. But he went on, and he went on preaching and teaching. He's a servant. He was a follower of our leader, the same leader, if you're a Christian, that I have. And that's Jesus Christ. What would Jesus have done? I think Marshall Keeble knew exactly what Jesus did, and he made a good decision that day. 30,000 people. I'm a preacher. I'm a minister. I started a little bit later in life at it. I'm not up to 30,000. I wish I was. We all wish it's an infinite number of people that we can help and serve physically and spiritually. One other picture, I didn't put it up here today. But one other picture of Marshall Keeble. It's probably better than any one I saw. Is he's sitting there and he's got about six young men. Six young men. I see some young men out there. Six young men sitting around him. And it said all of these young men around him, they were 15, 16, 18 years old, every one of those young men became a preacher, became a minister or a song leader in some form or fashion. Whatever gift you have, whatever talent you have, you're inspired by leadership when the ultimate leadership is Christ. <clears throat> I want to show you all my leader. And I put my leader up there because 
I, I got to make the PowerPoint. So I put my leader. I could have said our leader. I could have said the leader. But that's my leader. And if he's your leader, that's a decision you're going to have to make, not me. I can't make it for you. I can't preach it into you. I can't whip it into you. I can't schmooze it into you like some people do. I can't compliment it into you. Either he is your leader or not. And that decision has to be made every day. Colossians 1.18. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He's the firstborn from the dead. Now, what does that mean? Jesus wasn't the first person to ever rise from the dead. Lazarus rose from the dead, didn't he? The firstborn back in these days was a firstborn child by their traditions. He received the authority over the inheritance. He took the inheritance and he took care of his family and he gave out to his family and he carried on the family name. That's the firstborn. He had the ultimate authority over the inheritance. Jesus, in Matthew 28, 18, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's the firstborn from the dead. He is our leader. There's no other way. You want to try to go to God without Christ? Good luck. He won't make it. It has to be through Christ, and it has to be on his terms. That's my leader right there. That's my leader. Jesus Christ. I hear his words. I feel the Holy Spirit that he promised. I see God working in all of us and all those around me. But I see him in little places where you think, you know, this is bad. But in the worst, there's always that little bit of good we can build on if you follow the leader. The decision you have to make. Christ is my leader. Are you a follower? Am I a follower? Am I doing good enough? I hear people say, you know what? I want to be a minister. I want to be a preacher. I want to be better in church. You can't just say, I want it. And in closing today, I want to tell you, it's got to be a fire that's burning within you that you can't put out. Amen. That's what makes it through tough times, through hard times, through sickness and heartache, through good times, through pride, through all the things that Satan uses to be set us. It's got to be a fire within you that you feel like your head's going to explode if you don't let it out. You may not be a preacher. You may not be a song leader. You may be somebody that's videoing a sermon. You may be somebody that's cutting the grass. You may be somebody that's filling the Easter eggs out there. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, whatever gift you're given, you've got to have that welling up inside of you so much that there's nothing going to stop you. There's nobody going to take your hope away. And there's nothing going to bring you to death because we have life through Christ. Nothing. That's how you have to be. I've had young people say, should I be this or should I do that and everything? You've got to build a fire in yourself first. And you've got to use that fire to help those around you. Close and far. Brethren, today as we close, I want us to take this question with us. I want us to walk out of this world today. I don't know what y'all all do for a living. Well, some of y'all do. I don't know what your schedules are. I know that we are commanded to come here on the first day of the week <coughs> and worship. We're commanded to sing and to pray, to study God's word, to take communion, to give of our means every first day of the week. But we're commanded to live faithfully every day of our life. Each one of you has a gift. Now build a fire under it and let it burn deep to those around you. If you're a follower, then prove it by your actions, by your faith. It's good to have faith in your leader. Won't you come today, anybody that has any needs, today you can come forward when there's prayers, we're studying, whether it's obeying the gospel, whatever your need is, today, <coughs> as we stand and as we sing.